Good morning, uh, and thank you for joining us. Uh, it is great to have you at our reinitiation of the Nano Exploration Seminar Series presented to us by graduate students and postdoctoral associates of MIT. You can hear the stories of how science is truly built directly from the lab by those who indeed uh, perform them. So uh, my pleasure today is to introduce you to uh, Ting An Lin uh, from Professor Mark Boldo's group. Uh, the work that she has been working on and indeed extending the legacy of the students in Mark's group has been on developing solid state photon upconversion systems in a very unique way and very, very efficiently uh, using triplet exton annihilation. Um, now, to uh, listen to the talk, uh, please stay as you are, which is uh, mute yourself, uh, stop your video just to give us a chance to have a little bit more bandwidth for the rest of us. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please either write them in the chat or uh, at the end of the talk, uh, you can raise your hand and I will make sure I call upon you, at which point Ting Yen can give you the answer. With that being said, uh, Ting Yen, please take over. All right, uh, can you guys all hear me well? Yes. All right, so thank you, Vladimir, for your kind introduction. And as Vladimir mentioned, today I'm going to share my research, which is focused on developing general strategies for high performance solid state photon upconverging, and specifically upconverging based on triplet exciton annihilation. Oops. And first, I would like to give an overview of photon upconversion, including its applications, operation principles, and the challenges in solid state photon upconverters, which include backflow, trap state, and weak absorption. And in the second part, I will talk about how to reduce the internal losses, which I clarify as a backflow and trap state through a series of device engineering and how by doing so, we could achieve a, a very big improvement in both efficiency and to reduce the required excitation intensity. Finally, I will talk about how to enhance the absorption by uh, putting an optical micro cavity outside of the original up converter. And that gave us a 74 times enhancement in absorption and also reduced the required intensity to a subsolar flux, which is, is a huge step towards practical applications. With that, let's get started with what photon upconverging is. So from the two words photon and upconverging, you can probably already guess it means a process that converts low energy photons into higher energies. For example, we can do infrared to red or green to blue upconverging. We care about such a process because upconverging has many applications. For example, if we have an infrared to visible upconverter, we can convert the low energy part of solar spectrum to higher energies where silicon can absorb and that will boost the efficiency of photovoltaics. Similarly, Converting infrared to visible light can enhance the sensitivity in bioimaging or even enable drug release control because we know that near infrared light can penetrate through tissue. So when they go through the tissue into our body, and if we consider a drug that has little upconverging units on the shell of the drug, then the infrared light hitting these upconverging units can create higher energy photons that essentially break, breaks the shell and then enables drug release. Another example of upconverging is when we have a green to blue upconverter, we can potentially make a very stable blue organic line emitting diet by sticking this green to blue upconverter on top of a green organic line emitting diet and convert that green emission into stable blue emission. And these are just some of the examples of how photon upconverging can be applied to many fields. So how do we actually realize photon upconverging? There are actually two main ways to do this. The first method is through second harmonic generation in inorganic crystals. And the second way is using triplet triplet annihilation in organic small molecules. Here, we prefer organics because triplet triplet annihilation is a process that can be excited by low intensity light. And also the light source does not have to be uh, coherent. So we can see from this bottom right picture 
that this green to blue up converter is only excited by a green emitting LED, which means it is very practical for application. But you may wonder what is triple triple annihilation exactly. And before talking about that, I have to first uh, talk about the difference between inorganic and organic materials. So for inorganics, which I believe you are probably more familiar with, the excited state is essentially free electron and holes moving freely around in the valence band and conduction band. But for organic materials, the excited state is actually a bound electron hole pair, and we call this kind of electron hole pair an exciton. So when they move around, the electron and hole pair will hop together from one side to, to another. And based on the spin relation between this electron and hole within the same exciton, it can be two types of exciton. The first type, we call it a singlet, and that is saying the electron and hole have anti-parallel spin, giving us a total spin angular momentum of zero, and that is called singlet. And the second type is when we have a parallel spin in the electron and hole, and that is a triplet exciton, giving us a total spin angular momentum of one. And given this difference in the spin characteristic in, one, in the excitons, they also have different types of uh, properties in general. So the first difference is that given that the ground state of organic materials are mostly singlet character, the decay of singlet is through light emission, while the decay of triplet cannot emit light. It is also decayed through some heat dissipation or other non-radiative decay pathway. So we can understand this as singlet is a bright state and triplet is a dark state. Another difference between singlet and triplet is their energy levels. So in the case of triplet, because the electron and hole have parallel spin, we can imagine that the coulomb repelling force is also stronger in this case that will push the electron and hole pair further apart. And this geometry will actually push down our triplet energy. So another big difference is that singlet excitons usually have higher energy than triplet excitons. And finally, we get to triplet triplet annihilation. It is a process that convert two dark triplet excitons into one bright singlet exciton. And energy-wise, this process goes uphill. And that's why we can use TTA as, an, as a, uh, a way to achieve photon upconversion. So now we can start thinking of how to actually make an upconverter. But from the previous slide, we know that triplet decay doesn't emit light which means we also cannot directly generate triplet through light emission, uh, through light excitation. So we don't have triplet in the material to begin with, then how can we do TTA in the end? Uh, in this case, we have to make use of a, sp a special kind of a materials which can generate triplet by light excitation. That is materials with strong spin orbital coupling, such as materials that have heavy metal complexes, or colloidal nanocrystals. So we can consider this kind of material the absorber in our upconverging system. And after the absorber generates triplet by absorbing the light, these triplet excitons can transfer to the material they are able to do a TTA. We call this material the annihilator. So now we finally have triplet excitons in the annihilator. It can do TTA and then give us upconverted photon in the end. And that's how a photon upconversion process is achieved. So to determine if an upconverter is good or not, first of all, we care about the efficiency for sure. But another important factor to consider is the required excitation intensity to drive this upconverter. And ideally, we want this intensity to be as low as possible, which means in this plot, we would like to see a device to be at the bottom right corner rather than the upper left corner. Currently, TTA upconversion is very successful in solution and some gel systems that support molecular migration. And studies have also demonstrated applications in drug release control and photoredox catalysis. However, there are some applications that will require rigid solid state like photovoltaic or organic line emitting diet because these kind of devices are just sensitive to solvent. Unfortunately, 
up conversion in solid state doesn't work as well. And if we want the fabrication process to be completely dry, we can see this performance is just impossible for practical applications. And this huge difference in performance in terms of solution and solid state has to do with the nature of these different phases. So when we're in solution, when the absorbers are excited by light and then generate triplet excitons, these molecules can actually physically move around, find an annihilator, transfer their triplets, and then again, the annihilator molecules can also physically move around to find another triplet, and then they can do up conversion to emit light. But in the case of solid state, the molecules cannot move around. So when triplet excitons are generated, they have to actually hop through the whole absorber film, reach the interface, transfer to the annihilator. And again, the annihilator also cannot move around, so they can only find the neighboring triplet excitons to do up conversion. This is very problematic because remember that we have this absorber with a lower singlet energy compared to the final upconverted singlet exciton, which is saying this upconverted singlet doesn't necessarily have to emit light. It can just conveniently go back to the absorber. And we call this process a backflow, and that is going to reduce our upconverted emission, and we definitely don't like it. Another problem in solid state is that for organic small molecules, when the uh, when the molecules are very close packed, they tend to form low-lying trap state. If we visualize this idea by looking into an absorber having energy alignment like this, molecular packing essentially just generates a whole chunk of low-lying trap states down here. And these low-lying states will quench the triplet excitons. That reduces the triplet diffusion length and the triplet transfer efficiency. And by saying that triplet diffusion length is shorter in this case, um, I'm saying that in the ideal case, we want triplet to hop through the film without losing any of them. But in reality, triplet excitons get fewer and fewer as they go through the absorber film. So to overcome this diffusion loss, we have to use a very thin absorber film. But that poses another problem that is, in general, very weak optical absorption to begin with. So I just mentioned that trap state formation in absorber is a problem. And this trap state formation will also happen in the annihilator. But luckily, we have solution to this problem by introducing an emitter material into the annihilator so that these upconverted singlet, uh, singlet excitons can quickly transfer to the emitter before they are quenched by themselves. And because this emitter is usually introduced in a, at a very low concentration, so this material doesn't suffer from trap state formation. And that is how we try to maintain the emission efficiency in this whole annihilating film. But remember, we still have trouble in terms of the internal loss by backflow and trap state. And we also have the limitation from the weak absorption. So now I will talk about how to address the internal loss through a series of device engineering. To study the internal loss, we chose a green to blue arc convergence system with platinum puffering being the absorber and antracine derivative being the annihilator because this kind of system is already well studied in solution and has very high performance. So we just put these materials in thermal evaporator so that we can achieve a complete dry processed solid state system. The very first device we tried was simply a bilayer of an absorber and a nitrate plus emitter film. Turns out the efficiency is only 0.34% with a very high required excitation intensity. And that I will say is pretty bad. But we haven't done anything yet to the system, so it's also not surprising it is so bad. And the first thing we did was to try reducing the backflow by introducing a blocker material called DMPPP. We chose this material because of two main reasons. The first reason is because the singular energy of this blocker is higher than our annihilator. So then now backflow becomes endothermic. The second reason is that 
the triplet energy of this blocker sits in between the triplet of the absorber and the annihilator so that the whole triplet transfer process can still happen. If we look into the efficiency, the trick sort of works and the required excitation intensity is also reduced by a lot. And if we come back to this energy diagram to the left hand side, we think this improvement is not just because we already blocked the backflow from Singler. It also has something to do with the trap state down here in the absorber. Yes, we haven't solved the problem of trap state yet here, but if we consider the device structure in the previous binary one, without this blocker, we can imagine that even if triplet excitons successfully get into the annihilator, the trap state down here can still uh, quench the triplet excitons within the annihilator, and that's another loss. But now with this blocker in between, this slightly higher triplet can actually also block the backflow of triplet exciton from the annihilator. So that's the good thing of introducing a blocker material. But remember, I also just mentioned that we haven't solved the problem of trap state. So the next thing is to deal with it. And an intuitive way to do this is to mimic the situation in solution where the molecules are far apart from each other. So we just disperse the whole absorber into the annihilator film at a very low concentration so that we can make sure they are not closely packed and then form those low lying trap states. In terms of efficiency here, it improved by a lot, which is saying that trap state formation might be the major loss in our system. But a little bummer here is that our required excitation intensity went back higher compared to the previous blocker device. And we think there are two reasons causing this, uh, th th this thing. The first, uh, the first reason is that the initial triplet density in this uh, thick device is lower compared to the previous two cases, because now the absorber is spread out in this whole film compared to the previous case where it is condensed in one very thin absorber film. And a second reason has to do with backflow because in the previous cases, we already had a annihilator and the absorber in separated film, but we still had backflow. And now that we have them in the same layer, we do expect backflow to get even worse compared to the previous two cases. So it is very important to reduce both backflow and trap formation at the same time. And given that the previous uh, triple dope device doesn't quite work in terms of backflow, we went back to the structure of two layer system so that at least now the absorber and the annihilator are separated more compared to the previous case. And we just borrow the idea that diluting the absorber can reduce trap state formation. So we introduced a host material into this system. And in fact, we use our blocker as our host and then keep the absorber at a higher concentration so that we can still maintain green absorption Turns out the trick works very well. Both the efficiency and the required excitation intensity are improved by a lot. So in summary, we tried three different strategies to reduce the internal loss in solid state up conversion. First, we introduced a blocker material to reduce backflow. And then we try to reduce trap state by diluting the absorber, but we are back to the situation where we have very bad backflow. So we went back to a bilayer structure, and then by diluting the absorber, we successfully improved the efficiency by seven times and reduced the required excitation intensity by nine times. That's saying we already pushed the dry process solid state system more towards solution process solid state systems. And more importantly, all of these strategies are applicable to other upconverging systems like infrared to red or whatever convergent wavelength you want, as long as this is a solid state triplet exciton up convergent system. And now we've learned how to deal with internal loss, I'm going to share how to address the external limitation from the weak absorption we had before. In this study, we used a solid state infrared to visible up converter, which is developed by our group about four years ago. And in that study, we analyzed the impact of absorber thickness on the upconverted emission intensity. 
and we found that the absorber is limited to two monolayers, which gave us very low infrared absorption of less than 1%. So since we cannot solve the problem with the original materials, we added external optical structures to enhance infrared absorption. And by adding this spacer and a silver back mirror, we can redirect the infrared light back to the front side so that this incident beam passes through the absorber two times compared to the previous case where it only passed by one time. And it is important to find the thickness of the spacer so that the resonant wavelength matches our incident beam. And experimentally, we use a 980 nanometer laser. So we model for this wavelength and found that around 60 nanometers of spacer, we will have about 3.7 times enhancement in absorption. We also tried to plot the electric field intensity distribution in this device stack and found that indeed, by adding this uh, single mirror structure, we can maximize the electric field in the absorber layer. But the problem here is that the original absorption is less than 1%, and increasing by 3.7 times is certainly not enough. So we do hope to do a better job in, in terms of increasing the absorption. Well, the information here is that if one single mirror can already enhance the absorption by 3.7 times, then adding a front mirror can absolutely further enhance the absorption because now that the incident beam will be trapped in this double mirror structure and then it can bounce back and forth passing by the absorber many many times to enhance the absorption. One important thing to note here is that our front mirror is not a completely reflective silver mirror. It is actually a dielectric mirror and then we design the thickness such that it is able to reflect infrared light, but it is transparent in the visible region so that this upconverted emission can still escape the cavity. Again, in this kind of device structure, it is very important to fine tune the spacer thickness so that we can hit the resonant wavelength we want. Again, we do the modeling around 980 nanometers and found the optimal spatial thickness can potentially give us 74 times enhancement in absorption. But this structure is even more sensitive to the spatial thickness compared to the previous single mirror structure. As we can see in this electric field distribution plot, the different spatial thickness gives very different electric field intensity within our absorber layer. So we had to be extra careful when making this device. Now, we have two external structures that can enhance infrared absorption, and we are certainly curious about the impact on upconverted emission. So for the single mirror device with about 3.7 times increase in absorption, it gave us a 11 times brighter upconverted emission. And for this microcavity device with about 74 times enhancement in absorption, the upconverted emission was actually more than 200 times brighter than the very original device. And given this drastic, drastically enhanced upconverted emission, we're able to directly measure the external efficiency of this microcavity structure. And then this is actually the first number ever reported for a solid state infrared to visible TTA upconverter. Most importantly, this microcavity device reduces the required excitation intensity by two orders of magnitude, and that is down to below one sun. So this is indeed a huge step towards application because now we can actually drive this up converter by just putting it in under the sunlight. That will bring us to the conclusion of how to mitigate, mitigate the losses in solid state up converters. So to reduce internal loss, we can introduce a blocker material to reduce backflow and to keep the annihilator and the absorber in separated film while diluting the absorber a bit so that we can reduce both tra trap state formation and a backflow. With this approach, we improve the dry process solid state up converters to work solid, uh, solution process solid state systems. And to enhance optical absorption, we put the original upconverter into an optical microcavity. 
and that gave us more than 200 times stronger upconverted emission and re reduced the required excitation intensity down to a subsolar flux. And actually, all of these strategies are applicable to solid state upconverters based on triplet exciton annihilation. And we have demonstrated by the performance enhancement that these strategies are actually very effective. So we also demonstrated that solid state TTA upconverters are more feasible for practical applications now. With that, I'd like to thank you for listening to this talk and I'm happy to take questions. Ting An, uh, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Um, at this point, uh, the floor is open. Uh, if you have any questions, thank you very much for the clapping as well. <laughs> That's very much appreciated. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, uh, please go ahead and send them in the chat. Uh, I will make sure I go ahead and relate them to Ting An. Um, at the same time, uh, you can also raise your hand and I'll, of course, be glad to call on you so you can verbally ask for a question. Well, uh, I will start, of course, because uh, this particular topic is uh, particularly relevant when it comes to uh, ability to take any color of light and indeed upconvert it. Consequently, as you mentioned, solar applications would dramatically benefit from this kind of uh, opportunity. Is there an estimate uh, on what would be the increased efficiency that could be achieved by capturing all that right now not captured infrared light and not converted to solar light? And I appreciate that that would be very much dependent on the band gap of your solar cell. Yeah. But you know, if you had a two micron light and you cannot convert it to one micron light, or if you had one and a half micron light and convert it to 750 nanometer, Mm -hmm. That certainly would be a boost to the present performance of silicon cells. Yeah. Do you have any sense of what would be an additional opportunity and improvement if we had the chance to use up conversion? Yeah, so if we think of the most ideal case where we're able to convert all the lower energy part of infrared to a higher than silicon band gap, then I think it's around, it could be around 15 to 20% enhancement in general. Wow. <laughs> but that's the ideal case because like you just mentioned, we cannot convert the like longer wavelength than two micron to less than one micron. But if we consider those process by using some cascading up convergence system as well, that could be achievable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it, in your very specific system, you have very specific color you need to capture uh, yeah. to make infrared and then be able to boost it up to the visible. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I guess the other thing that comes to mind is that since all the color you make is always red and always a particular color red, mm -hmm. it would allow you to optimize your solar cell to be particularly efficient at capturing that red color, right? Yeah. Which might give you additional boost in performance <laughs> when yeah, it comes to... That number was just an estimate from silicon absorption and then those uh, available flux at infrared. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the particular choices, again, of chemicals you use to make the upconversion are dependent on the materials you have found in a lab. Uh, but I imagine that there is a large section of the chemistry catalog that you should be able to access. <laughs> and hence, by looking yeah. through the Merck or other chemicals available to you, uh, you might find many other materials. Is there a sense of how would you go about choosing uh, a particular material? What is it that you look in it to make it particularly successful in a triple to triple up conversion? Um, so actually, let me get back to the very first device structure. Because in this study, I actually chose all these materials. So the first thing is that they have to be evaporable because I want to do dry process. That's important. So that I already nailed down to organic lime emitting diet materials because we know that they are evaporable and we are very sure the material properties in solid state is already studied. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the first consideration. And then of course, for the absorber, we want some material that has very strong spin orbital coupling. So that goes to some materials with heavy metal in mm -hmm also in the audit community. And for the annihilator, 
it has to do very efficient triple triple annihilation. So that also again nail, uh, nails down the material category I can choose from because I have to make sure that the material does TTA. And also thanks to all that community again, that's very well studied. And for this particular system, because I'm aiming for green to blue up conversion. So I just choose from the absorption spectrum of uh, absorber from that cat category of materials and the emission spectrum of this annihilator category. So that I want the emission to be in blue and I want the absorption to be in green for the absorber. So that's the very basic, like the bottom line principle of choosing materials. And another additional thing I will consider is that the annihilator must have very high emission efficiency. Otherwise the upconverted excitons just cannot get out of the system. So those are some basic choice. Oh, another very important thing I forgot to mention is that the triplet energy of the annihilator has to be lower than the triplet energy of the absorber. Otherwise it doesn't transfer triplet to begin with. So yeah, those are some of the basic principles. And I agree what Vladimir just said that there are like hundreds of thousands of organic materials I can choose from, but based on some like practical considerations and these are some materials that that's very easy to access. So I just chose these materials because the main focus is to study the systematic engineering rather than trying to boost the efficiency of that particular system. Yeah. The, the, the fact is that once you do have a material like you do that works, uh, we can reach into the chemistry community and yes, we can can further that. optimize it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's excellent. You know, you mentioned that the spin orbit coupling clearly is strongly desired uh, to come up with an efficient uh, singular triplet interactions. Mm -hmm. um, platinum uh, or, you know, iridium have been used in the OLED community as the dominant heavy metals inside organic materials to induce the spin orbit coupling. But both platinum and iridium are fairly expensive materials. Yep. So if this is going to be used over very large areas, is that okay? Or are you benefiting from the fact that you're using extremely thin layers of platinum and iridium in this case? Yeah, I'm not familiar with large area applications, but yeah, I think one benefit is that the absorber is very thin. So even if we want a large, large area, we are not actually using a lot of material, but I do agree it is going to be pretty expensive to use these kind of heavy, heavy metal complexes. And I think in the field of chemistry, they are trying to develop some material that can directly generate triplet by light emission. But that's already out of my reach because I don't understand how that can happen. So, but I'm aware that the chemistry, uh, the chemistry field is actually trying to work on these. And in those kind of material, they don't have any heavy metal. Well, Ting Yan, I expect in your next nano explorations talk a few years from now, uh, a couple of years from now, we'll indeed be able to cover this, <laughs> this topic very, very thoroughly. But yeah, thank I'm not you. sure if it's going to happen very soon, but that's something I read recently. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, uh, thank you very much uh, for a fantastic talk. It is extremely exciting to see such an extremely high efficiency of up conversion and indeed uh, providing us an opportunity to imagine using this with sunlight one day, hence giving us a very efficient source of up conversion of energy. So with that, I will conclude the nano explorations for today. I will remind you a couple of things. Uh, one of them is uh, this coming Monday, uh, November 2nd, uh, MIT Nano is hosting a jobs fair. So for any of the students interested in interacting with the industrial members of MIT Nano and MTL, uh, they are indeed uh, going to be delighted to meet you at the job sphere uh, right about midday, November 2nd. And our next Nano Explorations uh, is coming to you in two weeks from today. So please uh, join us two weeks from today, and we look forward to seeing you then. Take care, and thanks for today. Thank you. Bye-bye.